Amen. I'm excited to be here, excited to preach a message to you. Uh, last week I wasn't feeling so well, so this week I'm happy that I'm doing better. <laughs> so some of you were like, I'm concerned for him back there. Uh, I was too. So praise God. Uh, we're doing better though. Uh, so last week and the weeks prior, Pastor Gary's been preaching on spiritual warfare, engaging the spiritual realm, uh, just understanding that there's a lot of stuff going on around us that we might not necessarily see. So I'm going to continue on that theme, and also I want to share on uh, how does our soul play a part in all that, because I still want to continue on uh, speaking about our soul, and that's just been a, a thing for me that I've enjoyed uh, reading lately. I would encourage you to read a book uh, beyond just the Bible. <laughs> Uh, John Ortbrook's book, Soul Keeping, Caring for the Most Important Part of You. I've really enjoyed this. I listened to it, I listened to it on Audible uh, two times, and I thought, you know what? That's one of those books that I want to order just so I can highlight and mark up. So this is a very good book. I would recommend it, Soul Keeping. And one of the main points that he makes in the book is that your soul is of extreme value. When you think of all the things in the world a lot of the stuff that we spend our time on and our energy on, they don't really have a lot of value, right? Like tomorrow we're going to do a fantasy football draft. Not a whole lot of value in that, is there? Now, we still enjoy it. We're still going to have fun. Uh, we're still going to make fun of the person who loses. Uh, probably be Teddy. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he knows it. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to have fun, uh, but there's not a ton of value in that, okay? And so we want to make sure that as we uh, spend this life, we put it into things that have value. And when you look at life itself, there's really nothing that you're going to take out of this world with you except for the one thing of your soul. Your soul's the one thing, and it's really the, the lightest part of you. Uh, scientists, and again, I don't know who agreed to this or how it all worked, but uh, they measured the weight of a person before, right before death. And so right after someone would die, they would measure them, and they estimated that 0.04% uh, percent of that person, or 0.04 grams left the person's body, their body weight. Now, that's not very much, is it? That's not even close to being a pound. So of all of your body, 99.99% of you stays where? Here, when you die. Only 0.04 grams of you, your soul, that inner part of you, goes to judgment, to, to go before the Lord. So your soul, even though it's the lightest part of you, the part that you can't see, is your most important part that it has eternal value. Your clothes have no eternal value. Your car, praise God, your house, none of those things. Okay, your bank account, none of those things have eternal value. But your soul, your soul has eternal value. And so what I wanna do today as we talk about engaging the, the supernatural realm is you must understand that there is a, a war for your soul. There's a competition going on at this current moment for your soul. And we're warned, you know, we're, we're, we're warned in Scripture about this. Uh, the verse is 1 Peter 2.11. Peter shares with us, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against what? Your soul. Your soul is what is at stake right now. <clears throat> And if you think that the devil is uh, stupid or foolish or, you know, not knowing what he's doing, you're wrong, okay? He is, at his craft, he's very good. And he's done it for many centuries prior to us ever stepping on this earth, okay? He has a strategic plan, a scheme written out to get you. Do you ever think about that? That for your life... Now, I don't know what it looks like in hell. I don't think they have whiteboards. <laughs> I'm not sure what they use. Uh, but somehow your name makes it on some kind of chart, and they assign certain demons to you. And in the Old Testament, angels were referred to as watchers, people who would, they, you know, spiritual entities that are watching. They don't know the future, so they're observing our behaviors. And so they'll put a trial in front of you, and they see how you respond to it. 
They watch to see oh, how they handle that money right there. And you know, have you ever had that happen where someone's wallet falls out in front of you or you know, the cashier gives you an extra $5? They're watching to see how you respond in that moment. Do you just take the extra $5 and think, well, God, thanks for blessing me today, <laughs> right? You know, I tied last week, so this is something you're giving back to me. Thanks, Lord, all right? <clears throat> or, you know, that purse that you found or that wallet, they're watching, you know, and, you know, social media has this really amazing ability to put things in front of you that you weren't necessarily looking for. And they're observing you to see how does he handle that test right there, and does he does he click on the image and stay a little bit longer, or does he go past it? They're observing our behavior. Why? Because they want to see how they can trip us up. They want to find your weak spots, and they keep poking and prodding. And here's the thing. You have a weak spot. I have a weak spot. We all have weak spots. We all have blind spots. So to think that you don't, that's foolish, that he's going to continue to test you, continue to press you, and he's playing for keeps. You cannot be a part-time Christian and think you can beat a full-time devil. He will run you into the ground every single day of the week. If you think you can play games with him, it's not going to happen. You can't play in the playground of the devil and think you're not going to get burned. You can't dabble with sin. You can't do those things. You can't make agreements with him. Even if the grass is greener on that side, it's still not safe for you. But we pretend that he's not there. Sometimes we want to be like that ostrich where we just stick our head in the sand and pretend the devil's not there. Do you know that if you pull your head out of the sand, guess where he's going to be? Right there. Now, the good news is Jesus is too, okay? And he's greater, Jesus is greater in us than the devil is. But understand, the devil's there too, right? And if you try to pretend that he's not there, the only person you have fooled is you. Think in the animal kingdom. Imagine if like a zebra walked up to a lion and said, Mr. Lion, I'll make a deal with you. You don't eat meat, and I'll just come over here, and we'll just have a good time, and I'm going to pretend that you don't eat zebras. The lion will be like, well, before I eat you, will you do me one favor? Will you go over and tell all your other zebra friends what you think too, and then come over all together, and we'll eat you last, okay? Deal. Got it. What a dumb zebra. Now, do you think you'd ever see that on a National Geographic, zebras, you know, trying to make a conversation with a lion? No, they're going to get eaten every single time. But how come as humans, we think we can do that with the devil? We make deals with the devil or we try to play in the gray zone. The gray zone's not safe. The devil owns the gray zone too. Jesus said, narrow is the, the path, right? Wide is the gate. The wide gate has all the gray stuff. The narrow gate has no gray zone. And we have to understand that the devil's not playing games and that he would desire for you to think that he's actually just not real or he's just this little red guy with, with little horns and a pitchfork during uh, October, during Halloween. He's more than that. He's real. He's a spiritual entity and he's more powerful than you and I. Now, thank God God's in us and we have deity and that we're able to overcome that. I'm not trying to make you scared, but understand that he's real and that he's playing for keeps that he's not just sitting here thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll let them live their life in peace. Do you think the devil's actually going to let you live your life in peace? No. Then why would you ever put your armor down? Why would you ever sit there and think, well, you know, it's okay. I go to church. You can come to church and he'll still kick your butt. He'll do it from this side to this side of the building all day long. Well, I give tithes, I give offerings, I do all the things I'm supposed to do. Well, you got to make sure you finish the rest of that verse. Or actually, you need to begin with the first part of that verse, and that's in uh, James 4, 7. We'll look there real quick. <clears throat> James 4, 7. <clears throat> we oftentimes will quote the second part of this verse without quoting the first part of the verse. We will often say in regards to the devil, I am resisting the devil and he's going to flee from me. How do we know that's true? That's true. But read the first part of the verse. What's the first part of the verse say? 
Ah, the part we don't like. Because we want to live our life the way we want to live it and still have success in the spiritual realm. You can't have both. Either you're fully submitted to Christ or you're not. It's not, oh, I get to be a Christian, go to church, and I still get to have all the fun I want in the world. It's not the way it works. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, let's just read the verses above it and below it. Verse 6, he says, he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resist who? The proud. He resists the proud. You cannot afford to have pride in your life. You can't sit there and think, man, I can do this on my own. I'm able to handle this. I'm able to handle this temptation. You know, maybe, you know, you struggle with a porn addiction. Well, I can kind of, you know, go on the websites. I won't look, though. No, you'll trip up if you do that, okay? Well, I can handle uh, going to the bar. I won't drink, but even though I struggle with alcohol, I can handle it. I can go to the moose or I can go wherever. I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying a name or go wherever, a club. I'm going to go to a club and I know I won't get drunk because, you know, I can handle it. I have good willpower. You don't have good willpower. Your willpower will deceive you. You can't go places anymore if you struggle in those areas. You just have to avoid them. You can't. You can't put yourself in that place. What did Joseph do when he was tested? Potiphar's wife, what did he do? He ran. There's wisdom in running. (laughs) Well, that's a coward's way out. I'm gonna stand it and face it. You're a fool. You're gonna get overtaken. You need to run. You need to run from the temptation, not play around with it. And so you see here, he says in uh, chapter four, verse six of James, God will resist the proud, the people who think they can do it on their own. Your gifts and your talents are actually a hindrance to you. I'll say it again. Your gifts and your talents and your education can actually be a hindrance to you because he says, I give grace to who? The humble. Humble simply just means that you're going to project somebody else other than you. When Jesus came, did he go around and say, woe is me, poor is me, I'm a terrible person? No, he said, I'm going to exalt who? The Father, that he was always redirecting attention to the Father. Humility is projecting somebody else other than you. You need to start projecting who in your life? Jesus, not yourself. But don't we want to take credit for stuff when it goes good and the boss comes in and says, man, who did such a good job? You don't say that guy, all right? (laughs) Who does that? You point at yourself and say, I, well, I did. I came up with the idea. We want credit all the time, don't we? You never point the finger. The only time something is mess, the only time you point the finger is when something messes up, right? Just look at a three year old. You know, who broke the toy? Johnny did, right? You know, you point the finger at your sibling that I didn't do it, right? I mean, I did that with my brother Jason all the time. We broke things all the time. Dad would come in, who did it? Jason, Jason. <laughs> Okay, you know, that's how siblings are. You point the finger when things are bad, but when things go well, who do you want to be praised? Ourself. I mean, ultimately, we're pretty selfish people. I mean, when a photo is taken, who do you look for in the photo? Yourself. You check the photo first, and if it looks good, you're okay with the photo, regardless of how everyone else looks, right? If you look good, it's going on Facebook because you checked yourself out first. That's how we are as humans. We want to make sure we look good, but we need to have that same attitude toward the Lord. God, I want you to look good, that when people see my life, I want them to see you, and I want them to be like, man, give God glory. Debbie, your your testimony this morning, wonderful. Giving God glory, praising God for what he's doing. So in James 4, 6, he says, I'll give you more grace to the humble. I want to be a humble person, that I'm redirecting praise to the Lord, knowing that it didn't come from myself. Now, verse 7, therefore, submit yourself to God. The idea of submit means that you surrender. A surrendered life is a powerful life. The devil will flee you when you surrender. He'll flee when you, when you sur- surrender. Why? Because there's less of you and more of him, and he can't stand him. He loves you, but he can't stand him. He's... The devil's not intimidated with us, but when you're surrendered and when, when your life is hidden within Christ, well, who does the devil see when you're hidden? 
He sees Jesus. He doesn't see you. He sees Jesus, and that is what he will run from. That's what he'll flee from. He's not fleeing from you. He's fleeing from the one that he can't look at, Jesus. He will flee from you. Now, here's the good news. Verse 8, you get to draw near to God. There's, no, there's nothing in between you and God. It's all removed that you get to draw near. And what's the promise? What does he say? And I will draw near to you. What a promise. What a promise that if you resolve in your heart today that I'm going to submit myself to the Lord, that I'm going to actually make him Lord, not just Savior, but Lord. Because again, the devil's not intimidated with just Savior, but he's intimidated with Lord. Why? Because that means that you're subject to God ruling in and through you. That's what he's terrified with. He is terrified when you submit to Jesus as Lord. But if you just simply say Savior, and if you simply just say, well, you know what? It's good enough that I'm coming to church, and that's all I need to do. He's not intimidated with that. The devil might be okay with you coming to church as long as you don't plug in, as long as you don't surrender, as long as you don't submit to the Lord. Clean your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded or double-souled, you know, being of two opinions, of two minds. Lament and warm and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and who will lift you up? He will. You don't need to worry about taking care of yourself. If you make it your goal to honor the Lord and submit to the Lord, he says, I will take care of you. I will promote you. You don't have to sit there and worry, well, man, I got to look out for number one. I got to look out for me. No, he says, I will lift you up. So another verse in this whole idea of you know, we're at war is 1 Peter 5, 8. <clears throat> and this is, um, I think, a, you know, an excellent verse for you to meditate on, to pray about. And it reads, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about to seek whom he may devour. You need to understand your name is on a list and he's coming to check you out to see if he can find anything within you. You need to believe that. Now, I'm not trying to scare you with that, but just understanding that, that there is a real spiritual entity that is out there. If I said to you, there's a sniper outside, how many of you would be really cautious on how you got to your car? You wouldn't maybe even go out to your car. You'd be making phone calls to somebody to come out and snipe the sniper, right? We wouldn't go outside, or maybe... I said, there's a line outside. None of us would go outside, right? I would, I would, that would be real one bad way to die, you know? Be eaten by a line. Anyway, uh, the point is, spiritually speaking, I don't think we take it very serious when we read things like this. We kind of just mentally accept it as it's a thought. Okay, yeah, I get it. Like the devil's a roaring line. Woohoo. Okay. And then we go about our day, you know, what's for lunch? You have a real adversary who really wants to see you fail. Now, you have an advocate on your side who wants to see you succeed as well. You have both spiritual entities, but to think that the devil is just some kind of silly little thing that you know, happens during Halloween is not true. He's a real entity, and you have to take that serious. Uh, so looking at this, so what makes the devil flee from you? Your submission to the Lord. What terrifies the devil of you? Your obedience to the Lord. Those two things. You have submission to the Lord and you have obedience to the Lord. And obedience, that's the love language of heaven. You know, we have our five love languages, right? You know, all those things. You know what the love language of Jesus is? Obedience. He loves obedience. That's what he wants. You know, there's a story where King Saul decided that he would obey God 99% of the time. And there was a 1% he decided he didn't want to obey God. You remember the story? He, you know, God said, you know, go out and take the land and kill all the animals, all the people, leave nothing alive. What did King Saul do? He made a judgment decision. He said, you know, God, I know you have a good idea, but I think I have a good idea too. What do you think, God? I'm not going to check with you. I'm going to do it first and come back and then ask what you think. Samuel shows up and Samuel says, what is it that I hear in the background? Is it the bleeding of sheep? Who, what, is, what is that sound? 
And Saul says, well, I decided that I thought it'd be a good idea to keep the best of the animals alive, and I kept the king alive and some of the best of the nobles alive. Samuel says, you obeyed God in everything, but yet you've been disobedient in this one way, in this one area. And that sin is what caused God to rip the kingdom from Samuel, that he did not obey. And then when you look at the verse, uh, we can just turn there, 1 Samuel uh, 15, 22. So go ahead and just turn to 1 Samuel 15, 22. And notice what Samuel says to Saul in regards to God's opinion of this matter. So Samuel then says, so Samuel speaking to Saul, the king of Israel. So King Saul is the first uh, king of Israel. And he says, has the, Lord, has, the Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of lambs. Wow. He says, you could give God all the sacrifices you want but if you don't obey, I don't want any of your sacrifices. Jesus echoes those same words in Matthew 5 where he says, look, if you have you know, issues with your brother and your sister, you need to go make sure you make things right before you offer up praise and worship to me because I care more about your relationship with one another than just you simply giving, off, giving up you know, sacrifices and offerings. Notice the next verse here in verse 23. For rebellion is, is as the sin of what? Witchcraft, that when we rebel, it's as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. When we rebel and when we decide that I'm gonna run and rule my life and keep Jesus on the sideline, you know, we're here, but you know, I'm the one in charge, you're in rebellion. And that we have to come to a place where we say, God, I don't want to be in charge. It's not actually fun to be in charge of your life, is it? I found the order. When I was younger, when I was your, you, know, you know, a teenager, you thought you knew everything and you wanted to be in charge, right? The older I get, the more I'm like, I actually don't want to be in control. Like, I want to surrender because I actually have realized that I'm not that intelligent. <laughs> and I know you're not either, so I can pick on you too, okay? Uh, that we, we cannot run this thing that when we try to fix ourselves, it's like, it doesn't work. You have to surrender to the one that can. Uh, so looking at this, what are the things that makes the devil run from you or flee from you? A fully submitted life. Be submitted unto the Lord and obey the Lord. He loves obedience. That's the love language of heaven is obedience. You know, and by doing that, you, you know the will of God. This is one of the, um, another verse I'll share with you is in Matthew 1250, this is the story where the brothers and sisters and the, the mother of Jesus show up and they're all excited to see Jesus because he's a pretty famous uh, circuit preacher. You know, he, if, you know, he was out being famous, everyone's recognizing him and the crowds are all around him. And so the family's excited to be there because, you know, they feel like they're important, right? They feel like they're going to get recognition for being there. Here's the recognition they receive. Verse 50. Well, I'll read verse 48. But he answered and said to the, to the one who told him, who is my brother and who, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is the brother and sister and mother. Wow. How do you think his mom and his, his family felt at that? They came to get a little recognition, a little, oh, here's you know, Jesus and we're seeing all this. No, he says, the people that I call family are the ones that submit their life to me, that obey me and do my will in heaven or the, the, the will of my father who's in heaven. That should encourage you that the family of God is those that submit, obey, and do the will of the father. So understanding this, that your soul is what's at stake. That is what is being competed for. That is what is being, that, that is on the line right now, that you know, I think this sometimes, that I'm only one heartbeat away from eternity. You, now, none of you were, were thinking about your heart a little bit ago. Now you all are, like, and checking your heart. Like, yeah, it's good. But you're only one heartbeat away from stepping in into the eternal realm. 
you should be not concerned by that, but you should be aware of that, that I need to understand that this life is fragile, that we don't know when we're going to step into eternity, whether you're 30 or 50 or 80 or 90, whatever that age is, you don't know. You need to prepare the one thing that you're going to take with you into that realm. That's your soul. All the other stuff stays. Only your soul goes with you. You need to be taking that with you. And I love the exhortation that Paul gives us in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, uh, verse 14. He says, therefore, he says, awaken you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. You know, it's possible for you to be in this room but be spiritually asleep. It's possible for you to be in this room and be spiritually dead. That we need to make sure we're not spiritually just coasting through life because that's where we get in trouble is when we get comfortable with God and we put things on cruise control and we say things like, well, I've gone to church my whole life. That's usually a perfect setup, isn't it? I've been there. I know some of you have been there where you, you become casual, but when we become casual in our relationship with the Lord is when we oftentimes become a casualty that you're, you're so casual, like, well, you know, I know the Bible tells me I should pray often, but I can kind of forego that a little bit because I'm kind of close to Jesus now. Okay. You know, I don't necessarily need to read the Bible that often because I don't understand it. And that's for the preachers to figure out and for them to share something with me. I don't really need to understand the Bible. The Bible is considered fresh bread. It should be something you desire. You know, I see some of these little babies out here, and they're really cute, and they're cuddly, and I kind of want to hold one, uh, but I won't. We'll we'll keep going. Uh, But you know what? (laughs) Do they ever have to work to drink milk? Maybe for you as a parent, it's work, but the baby, you know, that's what they want, right? They want milk. It's not a task for the little babies to drink milk or to want milk. And I know there's the exceptions to the rule, yada, yada, you know, some kids might spit out the the milk, but the point is this, a baby wants the milk. When the baby comes out of the womb, they don't have to be taught to desire the breast of its mother to have milk. It's just in the baby. As a spiritual individual, as a Christian, there should be a desire in you for the milk of God. And if that's not there, you should be concerned. If any of these little cute babies don't want to eat and they go a day or two without drinking milk, would you be concerned as a parent? Yes. What if they go a week without drinking any? You would probably go to the hospital, yes. You would call the doctor after day one. You would be in full panic mode in regards to the situation that you're dealing with. Spiritually speaking, we should be concerned if we don't have a desire for the pure milk of the word of God. That should alarm you. That alarm should be going off of, you know what, man, I don't have a desire for that. Now, you have a choice. If you're in that place of, man, I, I can't remember the last time I read my Bible or you know, you know, whatever it might be, you need to come before the Lord and say, God, I need you to change something in my heart. You need to reach out to people. There's a, there's a reason why we run together to help each other, to encourage one another. Remember, the zebras on the outside of the camp get what? Eaten. The ones on the inside usually do a little bit better. Get on the inside. Don't stay out on the outside keeping people at bay. And No, humble yourself and say, I need help. That's not fun, is it? You ever see a a man walk into a a clothing store? Can I help you find anything? What's their reply? Nope. We don't need any help. We're fine. You know, are you lost? Nope. Going in circles. I'm fine. (laughs) Okay. Uh, We don't like asking for help. Why? Because we all have an ego. We all have a pride. But we need to humble ourselves and say, you know what? Actually, I haven't been doing very good. I've been struggling or I've been going through something can you help me? Can you, can you help me get through this? We're designed to support one another. So don't think you're on your own on that, but understand that it would be very abnormal for any one of these little children not to desire the, their, their mother's milk. Yes, do you agree? It's abnormal if you would not desire to have the word of God in your life. 
That would be abnormal as a Christian because you've been born from where? Above. You have another birth. You're another creation. There's another creation in you. Uh, so looking at this, this passage here in Ephesians 4, uh, uh, chapter, sorry, chapter 5, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you will walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. That word circumspectly just simply means to stay in the middle. Don't play around on the edges. It's, it, it's unwise is what he's saying here. It's unwise to play on the edges, to play in the gray zone. Don't, don't dabble into things you shouldn't be dabbling into. Stay on that straight and narrow path. That's the place of safety. He says, um, you know, do not be a fool, but as wise, redeeming the time, making the most of your time because the days, of, days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You need to know what is the will of the Lord for my life. That would be one of the more important questions you want to get answered for your life. I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, you know what? I had no clue what I was doing. I just went through life, and I'm glad I got here. (laughs) I'm glad we all will get there. That'll be nice. But I want to get there with my mission accomplished. I want to be like Paul that can say, I know that I ran my course, and I know that I finished it. I want to be able to say that, and I want to be able to do that. So understanding the the will of God is important, that we don't simply just live for this life, that we don't just get caught up living for all the things of this realm. So we'll go ahead and turn to Luke 12. And we'll start in, let's see, we'll start in verse 16. So Luke 12, 16, he says, And therefore he spoke a parable to them, and he said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? Verse 18, So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Verse 21, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and he's not rich toward God. Would you rather be rich toward the world or rich toward God? Rich toward God. Don't be, the point of this passage here is he's not saying you can't have possessions or money. He's not saying that. He's simply saying, don't fixate only on the things of this realm. That you don't know when your your name is going to get called from heaven, right? Nobody leaves this earth without God being aware of it and being in charge of it. Like you came on a specific day that we call your birthday and that was all designed by God. You had nothing to do with that, right? You couldn't have, okay? You had nothing to do with that. And the, your day that you leave this earth, God's gonna be fully aware of it and fully in charge of that entire event. So understanding this is that your soul, it's more important to be rich toward God, not toward the world, that you don't store up a bunch of things. And so kind of using this example, we all have what I would say two lives, in the sense of we have an outer life and we have an inner life. Our outer life is what we all see. We all see uh, the job you work at, uh, the house you live in, the car you drive, the sports, the hobbies. That's your outer life, and we all can see it. Your inner life, that's the invisible realm. You could be sitting in here today, and on the outside, you look just fine. You, You buttoned up your shirt. You look real good, but on the inside, you're in turmoil. And it, I know there's no possible way we're all doing great on the inside because we all go through seasons and all go through different things that there's some of you in here today that your insides, you're in an inner turmoil, and I'm going to give you a solution for that. Does that sound good? But you have two lives that you're living, and let's not make it, and the point of this parable here is, let's not just focus only on the outer life, the things that are all out here. And that's the temptation, because that's where we get rewarded for. That's where we get the attaboys. 
Yes? That's where you get praised. That's all that's out here. Your inner life, that doesn't get praised. People don't say, oh, what just a sweet spirit you have. And they don't, they don't really praise you for that. But if you throw the winning football touch and you beat, you know, whoever, I was going to say Salina beat St. Mary's, but just kidding, didn't happen. <laughs> Again, uh, um, you know, that you, 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 if you're the one that throws the ball, what does everyone do if you make the, the winning touchdown pass? Woohoo, right? You're a celebrity. They all praise you. That's your exterior life. And we love that. If you do a really good job at work, you get praise. That's your exterior life. But your inner life is hidden, and most people have no clue what's really going on the inside of you. Usually just you and the Lord. And so I want to encourage you that in regards to your inner life, your soul, you need to make sure you're taking care of it. We do all these things to take care of our outer body, right? You know, we get enough sleep, we eat, you know, well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you know, the goal is, the ideal thing is sleep, you know, eat meals and, that are healthy, right? And, and to exercise that we know what the ideal is. And we might do all those things, but what about our soul? What are we doing to take care of it? You know, I'll, I'll read a, just a short little story out of uh, the book here. So this is a, a story of the keeper of the stream. It's just a page and a half. <clears throat> there once was a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were old as the earth and deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal, children laughing and playing beside it. Swans and geese swam on it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills far beyond anyone's sight lived an old man who served as keeper of the springs. He had been hired so long ago, now no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He traveled from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches and fallen leaves and debris which might pollute the water, but his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided that it would be, they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway. They had roads to repair, taxes to collect, services to offer, and giving money to an unseen stream, stream cleaner had become a luxury that they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post high in the mountains. The springs went untended, twigs and branches, uh, and worse, muddied the liquid flow. From a time no one in the village noticed, but after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water no longer had a crisp scent that drew children to play in it. Some people in the town began to grow ill and all noticed the loss of the sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the streams that fed the town. The life of the village depended on the stream and the life of the stream depended on the keeper. The city council convened and the money was found and the old man was rehired. After yet another time, the springs were cleaned, the stream was pure, the children played again on its banks, illness was replaced by health, the swans came home and the village came back to life. The life of the village depended on the health of the stream and the stream is your soul and you are the keeper. You are responsible for your soul, not other people, you are, okay? That's a responsibility that you have to have. And so I'll just kind of end with a couple of things here and then give you some homework to do. We all like homework, right? <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay, I want to read just a few verses here uh, for you and then give you a homework assignment. Uh, James, you're going to get a homework assignment now, Rick. You're trying to, I hear you barking over there. You're getting extra, and I'm going to grade yours hard. I'm calling you later. Okay. <laughs> So I already read James 4. Uh, so what's one of the number one things you can do to help your soul today is be fully surrendered to the Lord. If you're not fully surrendered and you're, and you're still trying to run your life, it's gonna be miserable. So I want to encourage you, one of the number one things you can do before you walk out of these doors is you make that commitment to the Lord of God, I'm gonna surrender. I don't want to be in charge of my life. And that's your number one place that you start because when you do that, a lot of all the other things just take care of themselves. Remember the story here. Once that, that stream keeper came back, all the things started to take place. 
when you surrender to the Lord, a lot of things just start going right for you, okay? Uh, so let's say, for example, you're still kind of like on the fence and the edge of, I don't know if I want to do this thing or not. Well, I'm going to give you a couple verses to ponder and, and think about. Uh, Isaiah 66. <clears throat> Verse 1 through 3, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. Notice what he says here. But on this one I will look, on the one who is poor and of contrite spirit and the one who trembles at my, at my word. God gets excited to be around people who don't think they know it all. If you know it all, he's not excited to hang out with you. But when you come as a needy person to the Lord, which he made you that way, by the way, he made you to be needy, come before him and say, God, I need you. When's the last time you had a prayer where you're like, God, I need you. I need you in my life more than the next meal, more than the next breath, that if I don't have you, I can't do this. He says, on this one, I will look who is of poor and of a contrite spirit. And then going back a few books, go to Psalm 51, and it kind of speaks of the same thing here, but Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will what? Not despise. He will not shun you or push you away if you come to him with a broken and contrite heart. He will not despise. Many times we, we, we have this in our culture where we want to be macho. We want to be tough. We don't want to see people. We don't want people to see us hurting or struggling or whatever it might be. That's pride. That's holding you back. That you would submit yourself to the Lord. And so, uh, <clears throat> I'll make this statement, and then I'll read Colossians three. I want to encourage you with uh, two statements here. One is, and if you can put the slide on the the screen. I am an unceasing spiritual being created for God's pleasure. Just stop there. You're unceasingly spiritual. You never cease to be spiritual. You know that? Even when your performance is bad, you're still spiritual. I have eternity set in my heart. Live with an eternal mindset that I'm not living for this earth, this realm, that eternity is set in my heart. I am sojourning in this land and soon very soon I will stand before the almighty God to present my soul to him. If you live with that understanding that there's gonna be a day I need to present my soul before the Lord, I think that'll change the way you live. If you live with that mindset that there's a day that Justin Monfort's gonna stand before the almighty God and take his soul and say, here's what I did with what you gave me. That's my job to do that. It's your job to tend to be the keeper of your soul. And what this should produce in us if we do this, here's what this should produce in us. It should produce a deep contentment in our life. I should have a deep contentment with my life. What does contentment mean? To be satisfied, to be complete, to be made whole, lacking nothing. If I'm surrendered to Christ and he is my Lord and I'm living with eternity and mindset, there should be a contentment that I have, that I am satisfied. I love this verse. Uh, I'll read 1 Timothy 6, uh, 6 through 11. This kind of summarizes even what I'm sharing there. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 11. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll go back to verse 6. So 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, now godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we will certainly carry nothing out. Wow. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For I brought nothing into this world and I certainly will carry nothing out. Food and clothing, if I have them, I shall be content. Wow. Wow. I'll let you read the rest of that on your own time, but isn't that powerful? Contentment. 
I know I need more of that in my life to be content with what I have. So being fully surrendered to Christ, having him in my life, I should be content. And the other thing I should have is I should have joy. There should be a joy we have as believers that if I'm fully surrendered to him and he's living his life through me, I should have a joy. I shouldn't be going through life, woe is me, and this is a poor life, and I can't believe God chose me to live now in America. Oh, woohoo! This is a terrible country to live in. I could have been born in Canada where it's much better. Pfft, not, right? No offense to any Canadians, but... <laughs> <laughs> we as Christians should have joy. There we go. That's how I'll redeem that. Okay. Uh, but understating that, that we should have contentment and joy in our life, that these things should not be absent from us. We should be satisfied with what we have and that we don't get bored with the mundane life. Much of our life is mundane. We do go through the different things of life and you, you have to go through, okay, going to work, coming home. You know, I can't believe how the dishes pile up at the house, right? Not that, like, you just, you do dishes, you eat, and dishes happen again. It's like, where did the, how come the dishes always pile up? Like, it seems like that's like, I always, you know, praise my wife for that. Of like, how do you take care of the house all the time? It's hard, right? When I'm home with the kids for like six hours, I'm like, this is hard work, right? You feed them, and then you clean, then you feed them, and then you clean, and like, you need a break. <laughs> anyway. Uh, looking at this right here, a fully surrendered life, we should have contentment and we should have joy. Those should be earmarks of us as believers. And then the homework that I was going to give you that you can read and, and ponder over is, is Colossians 3. And this kind of sums up all the things that we're, we're dis- discussing and, and talking about. If I can turn there. So Colossians 3 And I'll just read some of this, and then you can read the rest of it as your homework assignment. But starting in verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ is. So again, eternity is set in my heart. I'm seeking the things above, not just this earth. uh, Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above and not the things of the earth. Again, my mind is on heaven, not on, on the things of this earth. For you have died, your life is hidden within Christ. That's the best place to be a life hidden in Christ. That's where your soul is going to thrive when you're hidden within Christ. Verse four, when Christ who who is our life appears, then I will appear with him also. And then he goes on, you know, verse five and, and on about, you know, now putting to death, you know, the members of sin. And he goes through all those different things. That's your homework assignment to read those things. Uh, go through the rest of uh, chapter three there and just let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. He's the best teacher. He's the best comforter. And so in in conclusion, you know, I want to challenge you. you As I shared earlier, we have our outer life that everyone sees. We have our inner life that nobody sees. How are you doing with your inner life? Are you tending to your stream, your soul? Are you taking care of the one thing that you take out of this realm? That's what I want to encourage you with. Take care of the one thing, your soul. So Father, I thank you for today. I ask, Lord, that for each individual that you would uh, just continue to work on our lives. And Lord, we come to you as broken people. We come to you as, as people that we know that we cannot do this on our own. And so we just submit our life to you. And I pray for every individual in this room that Uh, they would have a revelation of their poverty and that they would choose to honor you over themselves. And so I ask that as we go throughout the rest of today, that we would have that recognition of you in our life. And in Jesus' name, amen. If you need any prayer or need anything, feel free to come up. Otherwise, God bless and enjoy the day.